Good. So team excellence, uh, uh, which is then one of the caring growth applications that we're going to look at uh, this hour. So uh, Skate in my human excellence group, I guess some of you have already been in contact with us, but maybe for some uh, were new. Um, we've actually worked in 29 countries around the world. Uh, not me personally, but as a group. And uh, we have three offices, the headquarters in South Africa, one in Pakistan and uh, one in Sweden, uh, where I'm sitting then at the sun as well. And I know there's also one coming up in Australia. So great work there. Caring growth is a research-based model. And this research was made by uh, our founder, Etzko Skeitelba, who did this at Chamber of Mines uh, in South Africa. So the mining industry is a huge one in South Africa. And in the 80s, he was asked to perform uh, research to understand the issue of um, how, how people uh, enjoyed or not enjoyed being at work and the connection to leadership. And what he found was quite astonishing and has led to all these different applications, which we'll look at. So we worked in uh, diverse organizations and with several universities since then. And uh, uh, it's, it's found to be quite universal, actually. If you're talking about mining industry in South Africa, or you're talking about banking in Sweden, or, or uh, some completely different industry in another part of the world, the core is the same. So let's look at that. So uh, a few words about Skatema in Sweden. We have an office here since uh, a bit over a year. And um, oh, that was a bit quick. I wanted to show you um, a little bit more. So we have an office in Sweden and we have a Swedish landing page, uh, like a home page in Swedish, but all the events and everything you'll find on the global page. But there is some information in Swedish for, for um, for those who want to read that. About me then, uh, this is the more official facilitator page, which I do find a little bit boring. So I prefer this one. Who am I? Uh, if I would uh, start with a picture of myself, it would be with myself on a bike. I'm at my happiest when I'm on my bike. Um, my background work-wise uh, uh, comes a lot from Agile. I'm an Agile as well as a Lean uh, coach. And since 2015, I've also incorporated then care and growth um, with that. And, and to see them fit together uh, just makes me very happy and I can see such great benefits from it. I have my own company apart from working with uh, Skatema and uh, I'm on an assignment at Saab at the moment, uh, a change project, a transformation project, very interesting. Most of my working experience I have with another Swedish firm, uh, Ericsson in the telecom industry. And when I was there many years, we also worked with change and we were a group of coaches called the Giraffes. And we wrote a book together, XXL Agile and Lean Coaching, which I've had uh, a, a lot of use of, <laughs> I must say, in my work. And just now, Ready for Printing is actually another book. Uh, it's all about the spirit that is combining agile and care and growth thinking. So very excited about that. My family, uh, I have my two darling grown up daughters who are studying in, in other cities in Sweden. Uh, and I also have now an extended family in South Africa, which I'm very happy about. I live uh, in Linköping in Sweden. And it's, I want to point it out because many people confuse us with Switzerland, but we're further up north and our chocolate isn't even near as nice as the Swiss one. So Sweden, uh, uh, up on the tundra, that's where I sit. And when I'm not working, uh, I told you I love cycling. And also, I'm a board member of what we call uh, the Swedish Classic, uh, which is, well, you could call it collaborative sport, actually. <laughs> Talking about teamwork. Um, this is the closest to teamwork you get in sports, I think. I, I'll send you a link to a video clip about it later. You can have a look. Right, enough about me. Um, the care and growth applications. At the center of it all is the intent to give or serve. And if you've come across uh, any of the care and growth stuff before, you'd know this. Let's see, we have a, a chat. I wonder if there's someone else who can't get in maybe. 
Uh, Mutala. <laughs> Zlatko put in Mutala. Thank you, Zlatko. Actually, I'm in Linköping now. And Mutala is close by as well. Okay, so at the center of uh, the care and growth, we have the intent to give or serve. And closest to that is the, the issue of personal excellence. And as you will find our take on any, any issue is actually individual because it all comes down to the individual person's intent. So personal excellence, uh, giving security and fulfillment. As the next layer, we have the team excellence uh, with collaboration and harmony. Uh, but the team excellence, is, this is what I've learned since I started to work with Skatema. The team excellence also builds on the individual's intent. The next layer of this uh, onion, should we call it, is leadership excellence, uh, adding on the issue of legitimate power, which we'll touch on briefly, because it has a lot to do with, with the team excellence as well. And uh, organizational excellence, embracing it all with a value adding organization. So talking about team excellence today, we will actually touch upon these different applications. I won't be explicit about it, but they all do connect uh, and the connecting point is the center, the core, the intent to give or serve. Right. Some team excellence fundamentals then. So I told you that the, it all connects and, and therefore we will start with a, a statement around enterprises or organizations. So enterprises, organizations, businesses, they don't exist for themselves. We don't have a, a, a business for ourselves. We have it to serve customers and clients. The intent of a business is to serve customers and clients. And, and that is a, a whole application on its own, of course. But here we'll just uh, um, notice that that is the case. And let's dig into this a little bit. And we say, what does that mean for teams? Well, we have a story of the three bakers. This is a small team. <laughs> we say normally a team in, in an agile context or any team should be around seven people, but this is a small team of three. And they collaborate, they col collaborate in this bakery, making this cake. It actually takes a whole month to make it. And at the end of the month, they all take a slice home, these three bakers. Um, and as we can see, there is a fourth slice there that uh, no one takes home. And that is what we could call a surplus. And the surplus is a measure of the degree to which the average member of this group or team gave more than they took. If they took more than they gave, they would start eating of each other's slices. And, and before we know it, we'd have to fire one of the bakers. <laughs> there would be enough cake for everyone, if you can see the metaphor. Uh, but as long as a group <clears throat> is there with the intent to serve and they give more than they take, we will have a surplus. So what is it uh, in a team context that creates this surplus? If we take that cone to the left and we sort of, we, we cut it like that, we can see the peer group here, a team. Uh, and actually they succeed uh, when the members of the team set each other up to succeed, then the team itself will succeed. So again, it comes back to the individuals. The individuals form the team. And we say there are three reasons for this. I'm going to try to take away the, the videos because actually then I can't see the whole, the whole picture, that's better. Three reasons for this. The first reason we're going to look at has to do with the leadership that the group is well-led. And, and this has to do with the fact that people don't actually work for organizations because they, they want to. They work for people or bosses because they want to. It's other people that makes us want to go the extra mile. So we're going to look at that. The second reason is that the group has a benevolent intent. People know why they are there, how what they do makes the world a better place in some way. And the third one is that the members of the team treat each other with what we call transactional correctness, that they are there to set each other up to succeed. So let's start with the first one, the group being well-led. 
When we hold courses in, in leadership excellence, we usually ask people, what is the kind of boss you'd work to work for because you want to, not because you have to, because you want to. If you could construct your dream boss, what would he or she look like? And this is the typical kind of uh, uh, replies would guess for, get for a want to boss. Clarity of vision, right intention, transparent, trustworthy, and trusting believes in me, supports me. You see, this is um, from a recent course. Gives me feedback, provides the vision intent, listens to my thoughts, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of stuff. And if we just look at this long list, we'd be intimidated and, and no one would dare to, to apply for a boss job. What we can see though, is that there are actually uh, doublets in here. There are categories. And if we look at that, we can see that one category has a softer ring to it. Someone has the right intention, is trustworthy, supports me, listens, listens come uh, in, in different forms here. Good listener, prioritizes me, is human. All of these qualities have a softer ring to them and they have to do with care. And uh, you can see we have a, a different category here as well that has a lot of a harder ring to it, a, a clarity, transparency, uh, honesty. If someone is honest with you and transparent, it's not always going to be nice and, and sweet, is it? But it's still a question of being there for me, you know, to be true, clear in communication, making you grow. And actually this is what we call growth. So the boss that people want, uh, around the world actually, across industries. You could make a long, long list, but really it ripples down to a boss that cares for you and helps you grow. And this is what we call legitimate power. Um, this is not the power that you take. This is the power that you're given by your subordinates because they trust you and they, they thereby give you license to tell them what to do. So is this what we see if we go out in the world? Well, getting this wrong is a lot more common than that one would want. And, and this I've seen uh, in more places than not uh, during my career, that we have some sort of hierarchy here. So it reaches in this picture up to the second line manager, but it could just go on and on depending on how big the company is. But you have a, a higher boss there who, really thinks that he or she is there to contribute to the result. And therefore he will request from, from his subordinates, in this case, the first line, line manager to, to report. And, and she in her turn really thinks that she has to uh, contribute to the result and she will request a report. And so it continues with everyone up the line thinking that they contribute to the result. And then we have the actual team who are doing the tasks, but they don't really have uh, all that time for the task because they have to report up the line and they don't get the support they need because everyone is there for their manager. Scaringly common. <laughs> so if we'd like now to switch this around to what we call a care and growth leadership, how would care and growth look like in the hierarchy? Well, make no mistake, we do want the bosses to keep an eye on the result but we want them to understand it's the result. It's not their job. It's something that comes when they do their job. Okay, so what is their job then? Remember the want to boss, the job is the care and growth of their subordinates. So the second line, the second line manager, he might have one or two tasks regarding you know, uh, the results, but his main job is definitely care and growth of the first line manager and so forth. The first line manager's job is the care and growth of the scrum master, if it's an agile context or team leader. And the team leader's job is the care and growth of the team. And the team's job is the tasks to actually produce the result. Good. Um, so what does care and growth of a team really mean? Well, the leader's job is to help teams to succeed. And in a successful team, we said that individuals set each other up to succeed. So a good coach or leader does not set up the players to compete. He or she sets them up to collaborate. You don't want, if you have a soccer game, 
everyone to compete to score. If you're on the same team, you want them to collaborate so that one of them can score so that the team can have a score. So this is what the leader can do. Help the team succeed by helping them to collaborate. Set up the criteria for collaboration over competition. So what would that then be? Well, this is from another a, a team excellence course I had fairly recently. What can uh, set team members up to compete within the team? By the way, in this actual course where we did this, we had such an interesting uh, discussion around if competition is always bad. It's not. You want competition, but you want it out there. You want it on the market. You don't want to compete between yourselves. You want to compete on the market. So within the team, if we have competition, that's a big problem. But what could actually set the members up to compete within the team is, for example, someone trying to take credibility individually for a team effort, team members that speak of I instead of we, individual rewards and benefits. And you can see uh, uh, how leaders can uh, affect this depending on what you ask for and how you reward. What can set the team members up to collaborate then? Well, the whole team uh, getting credibility for team efforts, uh, helping lifting each other, trusting in the team, listening to each other, common, clear and agreed goals, an atmosphere of group before individuals, and building team spirit uh, deliberately, for example, through team building activities, removing, deliberately removing competition between, in, within the team. So the leaders do have a great job in setting up, uh, creating a setup for collaboration over competition. So that's that about uh, leadership in this uh, uh, context. The next thing we were going to look at is the benevolent intent that the group or team knows why they're there and that, they, that it's noble enough for them to walk the extra mile for. So benevolent intent, uh, something that is noble enough for you to walk the extra mile for. And actually money isn't. Uh, you will not find people to, to feel um, thoroughly engaged or walk the extra mile for, for the company to make a profit or for shareholders to make a profit. Uh, I've worked for companies where it's been like a clear goal, we're here to make money. And, and I can honestly say, um, well, I don't work there anymore. <laughs> it just becomes toxic if you explicitly remind people all the time, don't forget we're here to make money. The money is the result, the profit, the surplus is the result. It's not what we uh, need to focus on here and now. So I see we have some, some uh, comments on the chat. Let's see what that is. Um, Scrum masters usually say their job is to be a servant leader. Uh, in your experience, do they not show care and growth for their teams? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think care and growth is a pragmatic and, and hands-on way to see servant leadership. So I agree with you, Has absolutely. Mm. Someone lost the sound. Someone has it. Good. Uh, I've noticed lately some very senior managers say my team, a lot of my leadership team, and I've become very uncomfortable with it. Actually, as a language thing, it's very interesting. We had that discussion just yesterday where, where I, um, uh, I asked, could I say my team when I mean the team I'm on? And at least as it seems in a South African context, that would mean the team I'm on. But I see what you mean, Brendan. I mean, it could be worthwhile to talk about our team just to make the point. Thank you. Or, or just the team. <laughs> yeah. Or the team, yeah. Get rid, of the, get rid of the sense of ownership. I own you. I, you're my leadership team. It's like, really? You just happen yeah. to be the leadership team across this area of the business. Yeah. Right, yeah. No, anything that can help this feeling of, of inclusion and, and collaboration, I think is good. Absolutely. So uh, back to this about the benevolent intent then. 
uh, a benevolent intent tells you why you're here, gives you this higher purpose, and it, it's based on the needs of your customers and clients. We, remember, we said that enterprises are there for the customers and clients. And uh, there is a, a process to, to come to this benevolent intent, a, a series of questions, which we could do at another time. Um, but when this benevolent intent ripples all the way down to the teams, their why becomes clear. And we're going to look at an example of that. But before that, I want to give you a few examples of what a benevolent intent could be. So for example, this is one that um, is from African Explosives. Uh, their benevolent intent is framed like unlocking the wealth of Africa. And this comes from seeing that with their explosives, uh, rock is broken and then new housing and new estates can be built. So unlocking the wealth of Africa. Uh, in Telenor, Pakistan, I think we do have people from Pakistan today as well. Um, the benevolent intent there um, is making it possible and the reasoning behind this was, at least at the point of when this was created, connectivity was an issue in Pakistan. And, and actually having connectivity made it possible for people to keep in contact, do business, actually run the country. So making it possible. And the third one I have from uh, here in Sweden, it's from our tax authority. Together we make society possible. So uh, with everyone being there to pay their tax, uh, we make society possible. I know we're a little bit of a laughing stock around the, the globe about this, but here it actually helps paying tax. We do get good roads and good health care. Anyway, so uh, benevolent intent in a hierarchy. We want it to reach all the way down to the team. We want the team to see this line of sight to the benevolent intent. To do that, we need to sort of break it down along the way. If it's a big organization, we, we want to see for our business area, our part of the organization, how do we contribute to this greater benevolent intent? And all the way down actually to the team framing their benevolent intent, why are we here? And that is then preferably translated also into mission statements and deliverables showing what is it that we actually do? What do we stand for? What, what's our mission to, to work for this benevolent intent? And uh, all the way down to a team agreement and thus, how do we work together? So I want to give you an example of this team giraffe that I worked with at, uh, at my former employer. Our organization's benevolent intent was empowering an intelligent, sustainable and connected world. <clears throat> and you can see why it's good to sort of break that down to make it more tangible, uh, closer to you. So our team's benevolent intent uh, was then, because remember, we were a part of uh, Agile Coaches. Our part of the organization is known for its motivated teams and individuals. How did we do that? What's our statements? We seek knowledge and share practices. We challenge leaders to be transparent and trusting, and we coach teams in order to drive change bottom up. So there you can see it's becoming a lot more tangible and, and um, hands-on. And then um, as the last thing here, a team agreement that uh, I put on the next slide, showing how we work together. Uh, we prioritize learning as high as doing, we always share, everyone is inv invited and welcome and so on. So this team agreement Coming from benevolent intent uh, via the, the mission statements all the way down to the team agreement, that is actually a very nice bridge to the third reason for teams to succeed. If you remember, the third thing being the members of the team treating each other with transactional correctness. We're going to look at what transactional correctness is, but we have a couple of messages on the chat. Let's see what we have there. Mm, our Swedes are, are Swedes the only ones in the world to get excited about taxes? I'm not sure. <laughs> we might be. Yeah, we're an odd lot, aren't we? Okay, the members of the team treating each other with transactional correctness. Let's have a look at that. What does that mean? So, <clears throat> to set each other up to succeed in a team, let's start off by looking at the the hierarchical picture, you remember of the care and growth 
from the second line, the second line manager to the first line, first line scrum master and so on. Well, then we have, uh, so I put scrum team here. It could be any type of team. Then we have the team there. And uh, so this is not a very diverse team. You can see they all look exactly the same, <laughs> but we have a group of people working as a team. And what we say actually is that between the team members, it is also a question of care and growth. Care and growth is applicable also in a team constellation to care for each other and to also help each other grow. So <clears throat> if you remember this picture about the want to boss, um, we could actually uh, talk about the want to teammate and we don't really have to change any of the words. So basically the boss we want to work for uh, could also be the teammate we want to work with. Care and growth is applicable also in the peer context. And so is actually the question of legitimate power. But what does legitimate power mean in a team context? Well, it means, for example, I trust my teammates. I trust them to, to care about me and to want my best. So if I'm not there, I'll let them you know, uh, decide for me as well. I'll trust them also to give me feedback um, to help me grow and, and to um, be hard with me when that is needed. So to talk about this with uh, being there to actually help each other and, and set each other up to succeed, I want to introduce to you the giver's model, uh, which is central to care and growth, the intent, the very core of the core. <clears throat> so we have this, um, this uh, man in the middle here, the self, who is surrounded by everything else. I am surrounded by everything else, and so is you. And that we call the other. So in every instance, I have a choice. In every situation, I can either go into this situation to see what's in it for me. What can I get out of this here? Or I can go into the situation and see how can I contribute here? What does this situation need from me? What can I give? And Depending on which of the two I choose, it makes all the difference. And this is also a, a, a complete application in its own. This is what we call the personal excellence, but we're going to touch upon it here. But remember, giving is not about being nice. It's actually a question of being there to give each situation. It's due to see what the situation needs. And remember when we looked at the want to boss or the want to teammate, we had both the softer theme of care and we had the harder theme of growth. So it's a question of both generosity and courage, care being generosity and growth being courage. So in each situation, we can either contribute with generosity or courage. And this is very important. Um, if you don't understand that courage is also, the, the harder part is also an important way of giving when that is called for, then you will just think that you're going to give and give and be some sort of doormat that people just walk all over. That is not the case. Sometimes giving is actually uh, being quite hard. So if you get this wrong, it, you become a taker. So few people actually go out into the world and think that they're going to, to be a taker. I'm sure there, there, there is everyone for everything. So I'm sure that some people would do that. Um, but normally it's getting the giving wrong. It's not seeing what the situation needs, uh, not daring to trust the situation, but being expedient in the situation. And, and so the unfortunate cousins of generosity and courage are cowards, cowardice and selfishness. And uh, if we uh, think or we, we act with so-called generosity when courage was needed, that is actually an act of cowardice. 
Let me give you an example uh, from my, do my daughter's school, uh, where when they were younger, now they're so big, there's no way I can help them with school. But when they were younger, they'd come home on the Monday and be rather crestfallen and, and you know, not knowing how to get their week together because there was this assignment and there was that test and then this homework. And how on earth are they going to get it all uh, to fit into the week? So as this uh, hovering or possibly curling mother, <laughs> you sit down with them and you try to help them make a plan for this. And it might mean that they cannot join their soccer training or they cannot meet their friends for, for cinema on Wednesday like they'd planned or, or something like that. But instead stay at home and study to get everything there in, in time for Friday. And then they come home on the Friday and they look completely nonplussed and rather disappointed. And you say, how did it go? Well, um, we got another week to do the stuff because uh, uh, not everyone had done it. So our teacher gave us another week. That is not being generous. That is being cowardice. That is a teacher that instead of holding those students accountable that didn't do their homework and didn't speak up about it, Instead of holding them accountable, he or she gave everyone another week. Now, he or she might have thought that they were acting generously, but is actually cowardly. It's to avoid conflict, which is another thing we're very good at in Sweden, apart from paying taxes. <laughs> but it's not only in Sweden. This is also a rather universal problem that instead of dealing with the one case that is problematic, we choose to sort of make a system change uh, to cover it up. So getting it wrong is actually uh, then resulting in a taking behavior. If we look at the model of transactional correctness, <clears throat> these are words that we've now talked about. Uh, the root of it is to be able to give each situation its due, to see if it is courage or generosity that's needed in this specific situation. And the primary attribute is generosity. That means that generosity is the basis for courage. As in a leadership or a team situation, care is the basis for growth. We need to truly care about people before we can start helping them grow. So courage is therefore the secondary attribute. These are all outward actions. And they are paired with inward reflections. These things don't just happen. They are a result, a product of our inward. So the corresponding inward reflection to giving each situation its due is seeing things as they really are. That means if we manage to see things as they really are, then we can give each situation its due. And also, if we can't see things as they are, we, we can't give each situation its due. So what might be hindering us from seeing things as they are? Well, for me and, and most other people, it's a lot of noise going on in the head. We have a lot of uh, prejudices and, and comments and, and thoughts about this and that and everything. And it's just so noisy that it's difficult to see things as they are. So what we work with in this area is, is quieting your inner dialogue, but that's also a different application. It's part of the personal excellence. <clears throat> so if we manage to see things as they are, we can give each situation its due. And when we give each situation its due, it helps us to see things as they are. So they are helping each other. In the same way, the basis for generosity is gratitude. Gratitude means that I can see that I have been given in excess of my due. So it's a way of seeing from the past, I have been given. Because I have been given, I can give. And to be able to see that I have been given, to feel the gratitude, the seeing things as they are is also very crucial. So when I, I can see my past with gratitude, not only can I give with generosity, but I can also trust the future. So, so the gratitude is also a basis for trust. And when I trust, I can act with courage. 
very simple if you just look at it like this. <laughs> uh, take some some um, exercise, some training to get it right. Right. So, but we don't always get it right, do we? So uh, the opposite of seeing things as they are is presumption. It's this constant noise that is going on in here and telling me, oh, this person looks like that. That means he is like that. Or um, oh, now I did this again. That means everything will just, this day is ruined. <laughs> if we have the inner reflection of presumption, we will act with expediency. We will become takers. We will see what's in it for me and what can I get out of the situation. And being in that situation, actually, uh, we, we will also feel resentment. Because if we act with expediency, the world will mirror us. So even if we're acting um, as with a giving or a taking behavior, the world will mirror whatever we're doing. So having a taking behavior will end up with resentment, which will um, make us act with selfishness. And if we're resent resentful, we don't feel this gratitude of what we've been given. Uh, so we also can't feel trust. And if we can't feel trust, we will act cowardly because we don't trust the future. So as simple as it may seem on paper, it's, uh, it's really something to work on. So we're not going to dig any deeper into this now. Uh, that is more for personal excellence. But I wanted to give you this basis because we're now going to look at a uh, development model. And I've chosen Tuckman's team development model that comes from uh, Mr. Tuckman in 1965. And I think you might recognize it al already from the first word. <laughs> I like this one. It's simple and it's easy to remember. Uh, and it's also very true. The first stage of a team developing is a forming stage and and this is also sometimes called the the honeymoon stage because people are very careful with each other and and you know a little bit walking on eggshells not to upset each other but that will end because the next step in this uh, team development model is storming and then uh, we are trying to find our roles and, and, and where, where are you and where am I and should I really be on this team? It's quite a hard phase to be in. But it's, it's part of the development, uh, which is encouraging to remember. Uh, thankfully, we can't uh, stay in storming too long. And hopefully we have a coach, a leader who can help us also to, to move forward to the next step, which is norming. In norming stage, uh, things start to land. Uh, we, we know a bit more about each other, who's good at what, uh, who has what role, how can we be helpful to each other. And this then leads to the stage of performing. So it's not that the team hasn't performed at all before this, but something really takes off uh, in the performing stage where we trust each other and, and we dare to take on stuff. Then something happens, maybe a new team member comes in or, or someone leaves the team and we take an, a new round in this um, circle and we come back into a forming stage again. There is also a fifth stage that was added on later on, a joining or mourning, which is when the team uh, will cease to exist. Sorry, maybe there's a reorg uh, and, and this team will just no longer be there then that is actually a phase of its own, uh, the team the morning that they won't be a team anymore. Okay, let's see, we have something in the chat. It's always interesting to see what that is. Oh, great, you like the transactional model. Wow, I do too. I mean, it's, um, and it's quite bottomless. There is a lot to it. Okay, so click through these quickly again, and let's see how this transactional correctness model then actually applies here, because it does. Uh, so I just put these up for, for your memory. Uh, you know, the inward reflection to the left and the outward action to the right. And let's apply this now on uh, team development to see how this individual transactional uh, correctness interactions uh, affect the team development. So we're in this forming stage, uh, and this is actually a, 
a stage where we will end up in resentment and distrust eventually. I mean, honeymoon, yes, but even from a honeymoon, you have to come further. And at some point, walking on eggshells, not holding each other accountable, you will start to feel a resentment and a distrust that will propel you into this storming phase. And being in this storming phase uh, with lots of conflict and more conflict than work done, actually, uh, you will eventually find the courage to get out of there uh, and into this norming phase. And in the norming phase, you will start to feel gratitude. And that, as we know, can then lead to, oh, that should have been green. It's red here. That's wrong. Gratitude and trust. Um, because you get to know each other. The best way to start appreciating another person is to get to know them. And then you might say, well, why didn't we just do the, the getting to know already in the forming phase? We wouldn't have to do the storming. And maybe you did. Maybe you did some team building activities. Maybe you also did some team agreement exercise. Uh, great. But then you have to redo it in, in the norming phase. Because in the forming, you're too busy walking on those eggshells. The team agreement will need to be uh, revisited in the norming phase when you come a little bit further. And this gratitude and trust then gets you into the performing. And here I wrote power. So power is actually uh, on the next level of this transactional correctness model, which we're not talking about here. But uh, this is where, where you come into, uh, when you're powerful. Remember, we talked about the legitimate power. Within the team, you have given each other power to act on your behalf, to give you that harsh feedback. Um, and then something really takes off. That is why this stage takes off. So in my experience, having worked with many teams through the years, if you have like a full-time team uh, working together, this is normally three months down the line. If you coach them along the way, uh, they will become truly powerful. And, and you can also, in some cases, come to the stage that is called high-performing. Mind you, not all teams uh, become high-performing, but that's another story as well. Then something happens, uh, like we said, a new team member perhaps should uh, come into the team. And depending on how this has been, how this has come on, uh, you will either have a feeling of presumption or a feeling of seeing things as they are here. If you have a uh, um, management that has just sort of said, this guy is now on your team and you don't understand why and you don't really want him there, uh, risks are that you will see this whole thing with presumption and be a bit cautious about it. On the other hand, if this was um, started off because you said that we really need someone with this competence on our team and this is pro this is provided, it's a much better chance for you taking off properly. And in the adjourning or mourning, same sort of thing. You can either be there with a feeling of gratitude or resentment. A lot has to do with how this has come on. If you just got again the message, you're no longer a team, you're now split into these teams, it's a lot more difficult to have that uh, adjourning or morning process. So I'm quickly going to check the, the chat because I'm so curious. Uh, companies' vision, mission, um, and or uh, AIM, I'm not sure, AIM, signal very clearly the intent of the organization. Not enough care is taken on de deriving that and not living it. Um, I agree with you. And, and let's talk about that at another time. I'd love to chat with you one about it because that's a whole uh, different application module. And Has says it's very important to do team building much later when the team is already established and performing. Sporting teams do this. Sporting teams can be a great inspiration for many things, yeah. Good, okay. So uh, wrapping up this with transactional correctness and team development in this uh, short webinar, what we see with care and growth and transactional correctness is that game isn't over because you've reached the performing stage. Something continues to grow. And this is what we call the team excellence spiral. Because these interactions within the team when we treat each other with generosity and courage or possibly selfishness and, and, uh, and cowardice will help us continue develop. And interestingly enough, 
people treating each other with transactional correctness develop excellent teams. Yeah. But also working in benevolent teams develop excellent people. And if you've joined leadership excellence uh, or heard Etsco or someone else talk about it, you know that the whole purpose of being a leader is to be there to create excellent people. And working in teams is a gr great way to achieve this. Because not only you as a leader can then help your people to, to grow, but their teammates as well. Wonderful. So let's summar up, summarize this. Uh, if we take a cut in this hierarchical cone, we see a peer group uh, team. And the intent to serve accounts for successful people and successful teams. Teams succeed when the members of the team set each other up to succeed, help each other be the star. We don't want everyone to try to score a goal. We want the team to work together so that a goal is scored. And we said that there are three reasons for this. The first one being about the group is well led, that people actually don't work for organizations because they want to, they, they work for people, they work for bosses because they want to. So this idea about the want to boss creates legitimate leadership, legitimate power with caring growth. And the second point here, that the group, the team knows why they're here. They have um, a benevolent intent. They are here to, to make a contribution to the world in some way. And the third one being that the members of the team, they treat each other with transactional correctness. They go into each situation and they see what is needed here. Is it an act of generosity or an act of courage? And that then, uh, helps to build these excellent teams. So to conclude, at the heart of it all, we have this intent to give with personal excellence. It comes down to the individual. At the application of personal excellence at the heart here with security and fulfillment. And then we uh, add the layer of team excellence uh, very closely, but uh, outside that, creating a collaboration and harmony in the team. We don't mind competition, but we want it to be out in the marketplace, not within the team. Next layer being leadership excellence, creating this legitimate power uh, of care and growth. And this has a lot to do with the leaders understanding that they are there, the servant leadership that has made a comment about, and also that they are actually there to create excellent people. That is their job. The result will come. Their job is their people and the organizational excellence with a value adding organization, an organization being there for the benevolent intent, being there for their customers and clients. And same thing there, results will come. If you're there to do a good job, you're there to support your people, the results will come. Good. So this is what we serve to do at, at Skotema to help individuals achieve this fundamental sense of security and fulfillment in their lives. And the trick there, I can give away the trick. You can't go to your job to find security and fulfillment. It comes from within how to do that. The second one to help teams to succeed by enabling the members, members to set each other up to succeed, like we talked about, and leaders empowering their people by caring growth and organizations who actually like we had the other chat comment there, they need to establish why and how they make a contribution to the world and stick to it. Really believe in it. It mustn't be just a, a, a sign on the wall. Uh, it must be something that we actually believe in and do. So how do we do this? Well, um, we do diagnosis. Uh, diagnostics is a great way to get a start. Uh, a survey for leaders or for peers in a team to see where are our pain points. <laughs> and from that to construct a journey together. So we also consult, uh, train, as you know, uh, I will show you some upcoming events and we coach. Uh, we coach leaders, we coach uh, individuals uh, in different positions and with different uh, wants and needs. 
upcoming events then. You know, everything, everything is available online these days. <laughs> so <clears throat> the care and growth overview we do um, regularly. So there's one coming up on the 90th of April. I'm not sure why I didn't put the time there, but it'll all be on the homepage. Sorry about that. And one also uh, on the 17th of May in the morning. And I put the South African and Swedish time because in Sweden, we're moving to uh, uh, summertime in just under two weeks. So uh, then we'll be on the same time as South Africa. For Pakistan and Australia, I know you guys figure it out <laughs> yourselves, the time difference is there. Okay, then the open programs coming up that you can also um, sign up for is the Leadership Excellence Program in May. The Team Excellence Program, digging into what we looked at today, um, coming up in April. A Personal Excellence Program, uh, talking more deeply to the transactional correctness and, and uh, what that leads to in June. And then we have a couple of application modules. So that's new. Uh, that we also uh, now have application modules as open programs. They are like little deep dives. So you see here, clarifying contribution in a leadership context, for example, how you as a leader spend time. That's why they're blue, because in the leadership area uh, and assessing contribution. So they are more hands-on, more to the point for that specific thing. And then on demand, of course, we do company specific programs. Uh, I said I'm an agile coach and uh, we've uh, taken up something we call agile excellence. So we'd be very happy to do that uh, as well as organizational excellence. And of course, any diagnostics, coaching or consulting. And online is global. I mean, uh, this session shows that as well. So just sign up, find other events and, and information on our homepage. Let's see what we have in the chat there. Pakistan, you can figure it out good. Uh, Australia got it wrong by an hour. Yeah, this is the time difference. It is a it is a hassle, isn't it? I mean, yeah. No, that was me. Uh, I did send out an email to the people I know, and then <laughs> Brandon kindly corrected me. <laughs> I, I, I was going to miss this if he hadn't told me. <laughs> okay, well, good. Well I got done, it wrong Brandon. by an hour. <laughs> well, I got the whole uh, code thing wrong, so I'm glad anyone made it in. <laughs> uh, but basically, that, that's what I wanted to uh, tell you today. And uh, I'd be very happy for you to be in contact. And you can also check out the homepage, the global one or the Swedish one, if you speak Swedish. <laughs> and um, yeah, just get in contact with us. Thanks a lot for your time and for joining. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Great, thanks. Thank Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. But it's not a mountain bike in the photo, but thank you. <laughs> oh, well, I'm a bit of a chicken with a mountain bike. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye.